All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. And on behalf of the Cultivating Innovation Project team, a welcome to our conference today, uh, which we've subtitled How and How Not to Think About Intellectual Property in Agriculture and the Plant Sciences. This will be a day devoted to thinking about the connections between the life of the mind and the life of the market. Uh, and so I think it's the more appropriate at the very start to thank our funders. Uh, the uh, principal funder for the project is the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Uh, but for this event, we've had generous support, first of all, from the John Innes, uh, our rather splendid host, uh, but also Plant Sciences uh, Limited. Uh, and the reception at the end of the day is uh, courtesy of the British Society for the History of Science. It's a particular pleasure to be at the John Innes Center uh, for a meeting like this for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, you may have noticed out by coffee, uh, Sarah Wilmot, uh, the archivist and librarian here, uh, has put out a rather remarkable display of archival materials which are to do with the connections between agriculture and plant science and intellectual property. Uh, the John Innes is a treasure house of research materials and I think what Sarah's put out there is just, uh, is, is just a, a small sample. But do enjoy that during the coffee periods uh, and otherwise. But, but even more so, the John Innes uh, and uh, if you like wider East Anglian uh, plant science, which we, which we could include Cambridge University, the National Institute of Agricultural Botany, uh, the PBI, uh, represents the site where Mendelian genetics first made good its stake to be the brains behind plant and animal breeding, at least when it's successful. Uh, it was here, of course, that William Bateson, the great uh, uh, evangelist for Mendelian genetics, worked through the 1910s and 1920s. He was its first director. And from then, right up until the present, the John Innes has been uh, at the center of this kind of activity. Indeed, even more so than we could have realized when we scheduled this conference uh, to be here uh, to, to happen now, uh, the events have made this even more the case. Uh, courtesy of Sarah, I have here uh, a, a screenshot from the Norwich Evening News, uh, 29th of March, 2015. Norwich bred broccoli gets patent. Uh, i just read you the little bit because I'm going to come back to it. Um, a new variety of vegetable bred in Norwich has been granted a patent after a legal victory. The Beneforte broccoli was created by Professor Richard Myvin when he was working at the John Innes Center during the 1990s. The new broccoli variety is rich in gluco, uh, gluco I was practicing this before, uh, glucoraphanin, I'm going to try, a substance which research suggests could help to maintain cardiovascular health and to help reduce the risk of cancer and is now available in supermarkets in the UK, Europe, and USA. Uh, so, uh, a historically important topic which is also up to the minute in all sorts of ways. So again, we've given this a provocative title, How and How Not to Think About IP in relation to all of this. Uh, there is an agenda of sorts, it's one that you can reject in the course of your talks, but uh, for uh, Dominic and myself and the rest of the project team, we're persuaded that one useful way into these topics is to operate with a more expansive notion of intellectual property than is customary. One which includes all of the ordinary legal instruments that we're familiar with when we think about intellectual property, patents, copyright, and so forth, but which also includes some more and less familiar kinds of intellectual ownership. And for, for these purposes, this more expansive conception, uh, we found it helpful to make a distinction between intellectual property in a narrow sense, or IP narrow, and intellectual property in a, in a broader sense, or IP broad. And by IP narrow, we just mean exactly those customary legal instruments or their surrogates. So I've been looking, along with Barris Charnley and, and Don Berry and others for some while, at the history of plant breeding in uh, the, the long 20th century, let's call it. Uh, and for the most part, one had to explain that, of course, you know that by and large patents don't apply to plants, but there are surrogate forms of intellectual property, which are nevertheless interesting. 
Two weeks ago, that may have changed. Uh, but we include in IP in a narrow sense, not just patents, copyrights, and so forth, but, but all legal, quasi-legal means by which inventive, innovative people seek to protect their ability to profit from their inventions and innovations. That's to be distinguished from everything else. Everything else which is in one way or another to do with the ownership of ideas and public claims to that ownership. So this is intellectual property in a broader sense, or IP broad. It's a deliberately open-ended conception in that I don't know how many forms of IP broad there might be. Uh, up until now, there have been two forms in particular that have seemed useful to think about. And like patents, uh, they have been signature features of the scientific enterprise since the scientific revolution. One is familiar and one is not. The familiar form of intellectual property in a broader sense are priority claims. Claims to have got there first. I've got Isaac Newton here because Newton famously, venomously fought with Leibniz to get public credit as the inventor of the calculus. But it does seem as if this kind of a dispute doesn't go back into antiquity. It's really from the early modern period that it becomes not just a feature of science, but a conspicuous feature. Even on some analyses, a productive feature. Uh, that the sciences function to the extent that credit is a public credit. To get one's name on a law, uh, for example, as Newton successfully did, uh, it is how one gains uh, success. Less familiar form of intellectual property. Uh, in this way, this is the most controversial and innovative part of our proposal, is to identify what we've called productivity claims. Uh, claims that a particular theoretical, empirical body of knowledge, set of principles, underpin technical or technological success in a particular domain. Uh, here, in the way that Newton is the emblem of priority, uh, Francis Bacon is the, the, the great spokesperson of the notion that science should be pursued because science is useful. Uh, and uh, the historian Peter Deere, I think, has um, rather uh, precisely identified uh, what he calls the truth usefulness circle uh, as starting with Bacon, something we're all familiar with. You know. Why is a particular technology or technique so useful? The answer comes back because it is founded on true principles. But how do we know whether those principles are true? Well, if they weren't true, they wouldn't produce useful techniques and technologies. That's the circle. Uh, which has become part of the public identity of science. And again, as with patent claims, as with priority claims, it becomes part of the public uh, uh, enterprise of science from the 17th century. Now, the notion that um, productivity claims should count as a form of intellectual property may not be obvious. Uh, and I think I uh, could usefully reflect on it just a little bit more. Why, why include productivity claims along with priority claims and uh, patent claims. Well, one difference to, to flag up is that where uh, typically with patent claims and priority claims, it is individuals who do the claim making. In this case, we're talking about a higher level kind of an entity, uh, a discipline. A discipline's taking ownership in kind of an imperial way, colonizing intellectually a uh, domain of technical practice. The sociologist Andrew Abbott, in a slightly different area, speaks of jurisdiction, different professions uh, contesting the ability to claim jurisdiction over certain areas. I think there's something akin to that uh, here. The second point to make is that for all that we are accustomed to the notion that science should be pursued because science is useful, it was novel in the 17th century, even into the 19th century, the very idea of applied science struck thoughtful commentators as very unlikely. Because it seemed as if there were two sets of conversations which had nothing to do with each other. One was about what's true about nature, and the other is about useful techniques and technologies. They seem to operate in different worlds, pursued by different people, with different kinds of culture. 
natural philosophy, the pursuit of truth about nature, is an open culture. Uh, the development of new techniques and technologies was typically a closed, secretive culture. Uh, so uh, people like John Herschel up until the 1830s could register their amazement that there ever came to be such a thing as applied science, the notion that the truths discovered could actually translate into the useful. Uh, we've lost that, but, uh, but we shouldn't. Uh, not least because, as with patent claims, as with priority claims, productivity claims are contested, historically and even at present. The relationship between a theoretical empirical body of knowledge and the techniques and technologies which are claimed to be explained by, underpinned by, uh, that body of knowledge are often very far from straightforward and subject to contest in ways that I think can be instructive. So if you pull all this together into a simple-minded diagram, you probably have something like this. Uh, 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 you can think of uh, for alliteration's sake, patent claims standing in for the whole range of IP narrow claims. Uh, priority claims and productivity claims as vertices in a triangle with the vertices interacting with one another. And uh, we propose this as a way of stimulating uh, inquiry, questions, and debate. And whether or not it does that is something that we'll have a chance to look at together in the course of the meeting. But just by way of whetting your appetite, so to speak, let's look back again at that uh, Norwich Evening News uh, announcement, uh, 29th of March, 2015. On a certain reading, namely mine, uh, you can see all three of these kinds of claim at work in this kind of an announcement. <clears throat> Obviously, there is the patent claim. That's the occasion for the piece. A, a patent claim has been successfully vindicated in the courts. Uh, there's also, of course, a priority claim in there, the John Innes Center. That's where this work happened. The John Innes Center got in there first, one of its scientists operating at the forefront. And partly implicitly, partly explicitly, we have productivity claims. This matters because we want to fight heart disease and we want to fight cancer. And the best way to do that is to fund fundamental research into molecular markers, the very bases of physiology, the lives of the cell. Uh, that's also operative in, in, this, in this report. So to my mind, it can be useful to disaggregate the kinds of claim that are uh, active here along the lines that the little uh, expanded IP triangle uh, suggests, but again, to be discussed further. Now, what might this do for people interested, first of all, in the science, and secondly, uh, interested in intellectual property? Uh, as I say, the, the, the image is offered as a kind of question generator. Uh, I can testify uh, from my own experience as a historian that when one begins thinking this way, one becomes attentive to new kinds of question, new kinds of sources, uh, new possibilities for answer. One thing I'm uh, obsessed with is the question of why it is Mendelian genetics became quite so successful quite so quickly. The further one looks at the uh, difficulties faced by William Bateson and uh, his uh, compatriots in making the case for Mendelian genetics as just what breeders need, the more complicated comes one's attitude toward the old answers that Mendelian genetics was just useful and was recognized to be thus, and so it inevitably took over. I also think that we are overdue uh, we here in this interdisciplinary audience, meaning not just historians of science, but really all of us, for a more joined up way of uh, thinking about science and technology and society. Whereby science, I mean, in this case, inquiry, research, the research questions. It's very easy not to go there, uh, but I think we lose more than we gain uh, when we try not to connect the dots. So at least this is one effort to do that. I also uh, like to think that one thing this can do for us is to help us be more inquiring about the authority that science holds in our culture and to become uh, more thoughtful 
about how that came to be and what underpins it. Uh, my own hunch here is that intellectual property controversies in the expanded sense in which uh, I've outlined it have a role to play in whatever that final account might be about the establishment of the authority of the sciences as the source of truth in our culture. For those interested more in IP uh, than in science uh, per se, I also think this, this might speak to some of, some of your interests. Uh, one of the things I think it suggests is that IP disputes, for all they can be dysfunctional in all sorts of ways, can nevertheless on a certain reading be functional for the sciences in the sense that uh, what the rest of the world learns is that whatever's going on over there, it's worth fighting over. Whatever truths have been found about the breast cancer gene, uh, uh, about a new way of breeding broccoli, it's worth people expending an awful lot of money to fight for the right to profit over it. It must be valuable. Something exciting is happening there. These kinds of controversies enter into the public domain in ways that I think have consequences for the overall standing of science. I think that uh, it behooves us to see IP controversies as sites where a number of cultures interact. Uh, just today, in this meeting itself, we bring together people from the humanities, people from the sciences, people from within the academy, people from without, people from law, people who study people in the law. Uh, that, I think, is just the start. When you begin thinking in a more expansive way about what intellectual property involves, uh, one begins to see it as something that coordinates everything from uh, views on openness and secrecy, on, on the moral life, right through to ways of organizing economies and governments. And I think that's exciting. Uh, finally, and this, this in some ways reiterates the, the first point, uh, again, ownership grabs uh, can be creative. And I, I don't mean by that quite to give the positive evaluation the word creative has. I don't mean that we have to endorse them, just that things emerge from them as well as being torn down by them. And, and again, our curiosity should be excited by that. So that's the this expanded intellectual property notion, which we've outlined for you, not so that you can agree with it, uh, but to see whether you find it fruitful, ways in which you'd want to dissent from it, uh, adapt it, uh, uh, and perhaps even uh, disagree with it or modify it in other ways. Uh, so the program today is a, is a chance to, to uh, develop those thoughts. Uh, we have three sessions. The first we've called Plants as Property. Uh, secondly, uh, in the afternoon after lunch, innovation as systemic. Uh, and thirdly, uh, in the late afternoon, innovation as sociocultural. Uh, that final session will end with a discussion, uh, a whole group discussion. So, so do pay attention to all the talks uh, because uh, there'll be homework at the end. Uh, we'll come together and, and uh, discuss, particularly for me, I'll, I'll, I'll lead it. Uh, but uh, we'll then have a little break and then a keynote address. Uh, at uh, the end from Dan Kevlis, from public to private goods, at which point we'll have that BSHS funded reception that I mentioned uh, at the start. So that's the program for today. It's now my pleasure to invite our first speaker, Barbara Fleck. Uh, uh, so uh, at, at this point, uh, we'll change over.